I'm Claire Parker. And I'm Ashley Hamilton. And And this this is Celebrity Celebrity Memoir Book Book Club. The podcast where we take freezing cold books, blocks of ice if you will, and we heat them up into just the fumes and give you guys nothing but piping hot detail. I was going to say, if they're ice cubes, we take the little pages that are ice cold, we use them as ice cubes in your fancy drink, and in that way we create a whole new beverage. The perfect room temperature coffee. Hot coffee with ice in it. (laughs) My favorite drink. So every sip has a different temperature, like when you're swimming in a lake and suddenly it's warm. Oh my god, I love when you take a sip and there's like a hot part at the top and then an icy part at the bottom. (laughs) Who is serving you coffee like that? I make it myself, Claire. It's my signature dish. Ashley, do we have anybody to thank today? The the worms? Yes. You guys, thank you so much to everybody who came to our Moment House live show two weeks ago. We were able to raise $3,000 in total with our match that we will be donating to the Brooklyn Bodega. I'm very excited. I love that organization. If you live in Brooklyn or New York City and you're looking for a place to volunteer, they're always looking for volunteers. And $3,000, that's a lot of books. That's a lot of books. And Ashley? Yes, Claire? If you were a celebrity, what would you title the chapter of last week's memoir? I would call it burning on the fumes of anticipation. I am just excited. I'm getting ready to move. There's going to be a new year. I feel like it's that end of year thing where you can either be like, wow, another year has gone by. Or you can be like, wow, next year is so fucking close and everything is going to be so fun. And it's going to be a really good year and I'm excited about it. And I've decided that next year is going to be a really incredible year. So I'm just kind of itching to get there, baby. (laughs) Claire. Yes. If you were to write a memoir about your life what would you title last week's chapter I like Ashley am so fucking cold and so I'm going to take this time to speak about myself to ruin your lives I know you can't even see me so there's no reason for me to do this but I want you to visualize right now that I'm wearing a coat I'm so (laughs) cold and I'm in a coat and so this whole time you're listening to me talk I want you to bear in mind that in real life I'd be making you uncomfortable with the fact that I wouldn't take my coat off because it's on a zip to the throat and if we were in a home together you would be like why won't you settle in Claire it's making me nervous I want everybody listening to this podcast to be a little bit on edge. Like, is she about to leave? Like, I want them to think at any minute (laughs) we're waiting for an Uber and we could just get out of here. Speaking of getting out of here, Jennifer (laughs) Grey is trying to get out of the corner. And I, I don't know that she should. I think she could stay in. She painted herself into that corner and we'll get to it but she's in the corner because she walked on over there (laughs) she walked on over and she said I'm gonna stay here for a bit and everyone was like you don't have to and she was like I don't know where else to go so Jennifer Gray for those of you who don't know I think many won't know was the star of Dirty Dancing which was a hit in the 80s she was also in Ferris Bueller's Day Off she was in almost nothing else and she blames that as does the rest of the world there is a protruding narrative right in the middle of her face that she stopped getting work because she got a nose job that took her very prominent feature down to an average feature and turned her into the most regular looking gal of all time. Somehow by trying to look prettier, everyone turned on her. Because, you know, famously, Hollywood doesn't really care about looks. <laughs> so there is this narrative that this nose job torched her entire career. And I guess I don't know how to walk into the way that she walks into this. So let's just go through her prologue. She starts the book with an explanation of this nose job. And she only mentions it a few other times throughout the book, like when it's truly necessary to the plot that is her life, which is honestly kind of often. But here's the thing that it teaches us. I believed this narrative that Jennifer Grey stopped getting work because suddenly she looked very different. And after reading this book, I don't know that that's so true. I think she's lucky that people think that. Yeah, I think she stopped getting work and I think that she looks very different. I don't know that the two are related. I think that what happened accidentally was the fact that she got work in the first place. Yeah, causation is not correlation. So we'll begin with the prologue, which is where she tells the story that everybody wants to hear. The story where I went, well, this could have been an essay and did not have to be a whole book. She starts with, whenever I found myself stuck in one of life's big dips, I could count on my ever-loving mother's familiar refrain, in case of emergency, break nose. And while she didn't exactly say those words, the message was implied. Right off the gate, this could not be a better setup for what we're about to get in this book, which is she's like, my mom was always telling me directly, get a nose job. And even though she never said it directly, (laughs) I could tell. (laughs) Who wanted you to get a nose job then? Like how often were people talking about it? Because I do feel 
Like maybe it was often. It does seem like her family was always saying, oh, if you want to be an actress, maybe get your nose done. And at the beginning of her career, she struggled to get work and she never considered it. She liked her nose. She liked that it was a bit different and she didn't want to get work. She kind of looks down on people who get nose jobs. She eventually gets her breakout role, Dirty Dancing. And for some reason, even though this is like the hottest movie of the year, it's a huge smash success. She does not get another role for another couple of years and she cannot figure out why. So before her 29th birthday, she finally gives in and decides to go get a nose job. Yes, she thinks it'll make her a little bit more castable. She likes her nose, she says. She says that she wants to get it made a little bit more photogenic. She goes for three consultations and the doctor says, oh yeah, we can just smooth that right out. He goes, you have no tip. I'm going to build the tip back up. Okay. So he, I think, doesn't add filler, but like molds the cartilage that she already has to kind of straighten out the profile without actually giving her like a tiny little nose okay so this is what she wants she wants to go in and be made more photogenic without having her overall look adjusted dramatically and then after this happens she starts getting more work than ever before she's very happy with it her life is on the upswing and then there is a little bit of a complication she gets a little bump of cartilage at the end of her nose which is I guess a common complication with nose jobs it looks like a cyst dick pimple almost I just saw one on TikTok that's the only reason I know okay it it looks like somebody has kind of a larger pimple at the top of their nose but it's white it looks like that but it's the cartilage kind of popping out so she goes in to basically be like what the hell is this and he's like I'm gonna need to put you under to revise that a bit he puts her under she wakes up and she has a whole new nose and it's very pointy it's small he's like if you want it down a bit just tape it down so that it grows back down and unfortunately though before and after this second revision process she had been cast in a Francis Ford Coppola movie and when she goes back to finish filming this movie she looks so different that they can't film her head on they can only film her through mirrors and like mist (laughs) they're like maybe we look at you on a cloudy day on a hill far away i mean it's a movie about sailing so like what if you sailed a little further away for this scene (laughs) what if you were underwater (laughs) i love to imagine them trying to hide it the way they try to hide pregnancies on sitcoms they're like could you hold a purse in front of your face (laughs) so she goes back the movie bombs they blame her nose job nobody recognizes her anymore she claims that she's at the cash register at grocery stores and they're like oh yeah the same name as Jennifer Grey and she's like I am Jennifer Grey and they're like no you're no not no way in hell we can see you you freaking liar in the world's eyes I was no longer me I had unwittingly joined the witness protection program it seemed that I had committed an unforgivable crime willfully stripping away the only that made me special so the world turned against her no one recognized her she could never get roles again I am as I was at the beginning not a whole person but a nose there's no rest of me worth knowing overnight I lose my identity and my career Eventually, this will be one of the single best things that has ever happened to me. But I don't know that yet. I found myself at the entrance of a cave I most feared to enter. Part one. So now we begin. We backtrack to the beginning of her life. Before she even had a nose, she was just two parents. She was just two people who had already gotten nose jobs the sensible (laughs) way when they were teens. So she has parents. They were both in showbiz. Her mom was an actress, very beautiful. Her dad was an actor. When they met, they were in their early 20s. They both had careers. However, once they got married and had a kid, his career really took off. And hers very quickly was put not just on the back burner, but in the garbage, I guess. Yeah, she became the primary caretaker pretty immediately, even though they hired full-time assistants. They had a live-in nanny for quite a while. And Jennifer Grey looks at this like a bad thing. She mentions a few times throughout the book that it was on the mother's side of the family. This was the family legacy to put your wants and needs aside for like the man's life and career. Can I say we're talking about people who were born in like 1920s. Yeah. (laughs) And like her mom would have been born in the 1920s. Her grandmother would have been born in the 1800s. She's acting like it's a unique and specific Oedipal curse on her family that the women often become homemakers and the men get to dominate the family. I feel like that was just the general global patriarchal trend. (laughs) Historically, women have not gotten a good go of it. (laughs) And her mom had a beautiful life and seemed happy in her life. She talks about the way her mom created a really wonderful and joyous life for them. But she was in just awe of her dad. She loved going to work with her dad. He was in cabaret. She loved watching him just methodically put his makeup on and get ready for a show. It was very ritualistic and exciting for her to observe. So he wins a Tony for cabaret. And then actually he goes on to win an Oscar for the movie adaptation of cabaret the year The Godfather came out. And I feel like that's very important to Jennifer Grey for you to know that her dad beat The Godfather. She says, I felt special, if not guilty, that I got what seemed to me the best of my dad. But within the family, my mother, brother, and I were a team. 
the spokes that sprung from the hub of the wheel that was my dad and his career. So their whole family really revolved around her dad. And she later goes on to say, like, I don't think my mom was aware of what she was signing up for when they got married. I think she had this idea they would be actors together. But very quickly, it was like, not only am I the actor, but you have to be the trailing wife. So, for example, her father was constantly going between New York and L.A., wherever the work was. And the entire family was consistently expected just uproot everything in the middle of the school year, in the middle of the week, and go wherever his job was. At the beginning of their marriage, he would take jobs and leave. But very quickly, he was like, I can't be alone. Wherever I go, the whole team comes with. Yeah, so they moved a lot throughout her life. We lived extraordinary places among extraordinary and accomplished humans. She mentions the kind of people who were at their parents' dinner parties, and it included Barbara Walters, Jim Dine, Beverly Stills, David I don't know some of these people. I knew Barbara Walters, though, so that was pretty important. There's a lot of name dropping this book. It's very Mm Roblo-esque in the way that we're supposed to be super impressed that she just happened to know famous people when she was eight. To me, it's very interesting adjacent, which is completely different than being interesting yourself. I mean, she mentions everything in an interesting adjacent way. It's not just the people. It's not just the people who were there. It's the people who might have been there. At one point, she mentions that JFK Jr., John John, (laughs) was friends with some of her friends in high school. And she like mentions a party and she's like, he wasn't there, but it was his group of friends. When she's talking about her dance classes, like the way she leads her life growing up in New York City, she's like, I took dance classes near the Lincoln Center. I took... Or even my mom, she studied from the Martha Graham. At one point, she goes to a party and she goes, Sean Penn wasn't there, but he could have been. And you're like, I guess that's true of every party. I mean, Sean Penn's (laughs) not in our studio right now, but I guess in theory, on a molecular level, he could be. (laughs) If he was in the room, he'd be in the room. In that sense, all things are possible. (laughs) In a greater sense, we're all in one room that is this earth. (laughs) Any of us could be anywhere. And in fact, we are somewhere. Together, we're everywhere all the time at once. (laughs) His son, her father, was how we set our clocks. It determined how our constellations would move. He was pretty much in charge of where we lived, and his career was in charge of him. But she is obsessed with her family. And so she's raised in this very bohemian way, and she loves being interesting celebrity adjacent. I mean, to go between New York City and L.A. back in the 70s, I mean, she does a lot of name dropping and town dropping, but she's obsessed with her family. And she said, I had always known that I was born lucky and that I was to feel grateful. I had the best parents. and My parents had the best life. I was raised to believe that art and politics and social justice mattered. Eating healthy foods and eating dinner together mattered. Being a close family mattered. I'd been spared the incomprehensible suffering and deprivation of the less fortunate I'd only heard or read about. We had enough and we would more than likely always have enough. So like we said, she bops back and forth from coast to coast. She lives either in the elite circles in Manhattan or she lives amongst the cool bohemian families in Malibu. So we read a lot about that lifestyle with Rob Lowe's book. Yeah, it actually reminded me a lot of Rob Lowe. She does this thing throughout the book, though, where you keep waiting for there to be a point. And there's all this foreshadowing for things that never come to fruition. So I don't I won't keep you on the edge of your seat. But she has these sentences like and became apparent later that saving for the future couldn't hold a candle to my parents desire for living the good life. A sentence like that primes me to think that later there's going to be financial hardship. We don't hear about it. Why say that it became apparent that my parents didn't save for the future? When does that become apparent? Because you don't mention it later. But there's all these things in this book where she's like, and we were about to find out that this would be the last good summer. And you're like, why? What happened next? And you don't ever mention a bad summer. Like nothing happens. So then she explains that her dad actually came from a famous Jewish entertaining family. Yeah, big in the cat skills, making their rounds at the, the clubs. I grew up surrounded by this community of legit geniuses, more legends than mortals, and with them loving me like I was their own because they loved my mom and dad. I actually think that that is a really important thing, the fact that she was loved and valued by geniuses because of her proximity to her parents. And I think that she took that in as like her being a part of a club Because she was invited, not because she like had to be there because she was a minor. This is an interesting book because I think her image of herself predates the term Nepo baby. Right. I think if someone had just given her that clue. At one point, she really thinks the reason she had problems her whole life is because nobody diagnosed her ADD. And I was like, no, 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 no. It's because nobody diagnosed your Nepo baby syndrome. (laughs) And if you just understood that there was no reason for you to have any success at all, that would have answered a lot of your questions. Right. Like your success was not like a hard earned fluke where it's like you worked your ass off to achieve something and then couldn't do it again. It was a thing that you backed into and then couldn't replicate it because 
you didn't actually care that much. On my father's side, I was not only the daughter of Joel Grey, but also the granddaughter of Mickey Katz, both well-known and beloved entertainers. I grew up knowing that when people were first introduced to me, I was automatically treated to a certain degree of warmth right out of the gate because of how they felt about my dad and or grandfather. So her grandfather got famous for doing like, I guess, Weird Al Yankovic songs, but he was actually Jewish. You know, Weird Al is not. No. I did not know that. I mean, stolen valor. Am I right? Jesus Christ. So he would do like Jewish parody songs and they were a huge hit. And then he would do them with his son, who at the time was Joel Katz. They like would perform together as a father son duo. But then the son got pulled in for the Colgate Variety Hour, which was a very big deal. And then he had his own success outside of his dad's Catskills circuit. She says, being Jewish was a seminal part of my family's identity, culturally speaking, but I also couldn't help but notice that my parents' generation seemed to think it's savvy, perhaps not to lead with it, and more specifically to downplay it, professionally speaking. So both of her parents actually changed their names. Joel Katz turned into Joel Gray, and then her mom named herself Joe Wilder, which is quite a sexy little... It is a very sexy name. And they had both gotten nose jobs as teens. That's like her whole experience of her mom. It's like, my mom was beautiful. She wanted to be an actress. She got a nose job. And then she was my mom. And her view of her dad, she spends like 45 pages talking about how much she admires her dad's work and how she really valued and admired being brought with him and like getting to experience his preparation to go on stage for cabaret and just like watching him perform was so transformative for her and like being a part of his life as an actor was something that she really looked up to and something she really respected. And then she's like, and my mom was there. It's so funny because me and Ashley both came to the exact same conclusion about Jennifer Grey, which is one that I think you've probably picked up on and that we think her life was very much just a product of her being in the right places all the time. And that's why it fizzled out because there wasn't any there there. But going back and reading this from the beginning, she says it too. It's like sitting here in plain English. I just don't think she realizes what What she's she's saying saying. (laughs) she goes in my immediate family having talent in a career as an entertainer was more the norm than the exception a life lived in the public eye wasn't considered terribly glamorous it was almost expected a life in show business was all i'd ever known or frankly could conceive of the most common denominator from whence i came was a desire to be a performer and preferably a star because that meant you would actually be able to make a living otherwise you were just some schlub with a hobby or dash dream I didn't see any of my parents' crowd having to take a job job. They all seemed to be living their best lives, passionately engaged, fulfilling their calling, which looked like the most fun way to live in the world, creatively alive, making use of all of themselves, never a dull moment. I didn't know how they did it exactly, but I saw firsthand that it was possible, and I automatically assumed that I would just do the same. She says a few times throughout this book that she never considered any job other than acting, And I think it's because she'd never seen any job other than acting and she wanted to have fun. I think she had this conception. I mean, there is this coastal elitism where you're like doing something artsy and fun and cool is so much better. I mean, who wouldn't want to do something easy and cool and fun as opposed to like grueling and monotonous? Because this is where I think the lie is, is that it's easy. She is seeing it as easy. I think as a child. Right. She's only with people who have made it. Right. She's only seeing the people who have made it. So she has no concept of the schlubs. I mean, that's the thing overall with the entertainment industry is you only really hear stories from people who've made it. So when people like start pursuing entertainment industry careers, it's because it seems like it's easy and fun and cool. And you don't hear the stories from the people who've been grinding it out for 50 years and never made it because you don't know them. Yeah. And then she's living like amongst the people who've made it. So she's seeing firsthand that it can be done. And she's not really understanding how it's done because she's not part of those conversations and she wasn't there when they were coming up. She only got birthed into it when it was already working. Also, I think if that's all you know, that's all you know. Right. Like struggle or not, like not everybody who takes a study office job has a picture perfect life either. But if everyone you knew had an office job, you just be like, well, that's what you do after college. You go to an office job. Right. Whereas if everyone you knew is on Broadway, you're like, well, that's what you do. You just go to Broadway. So that's what I wanted to say is I think that when she talks about how there's nothing she ever imagined for her life other than being an actor, it doesn't have anything to do with having a passion for acting. It has to do with the fact that she's like, well, you grow up and you get a job and the job is actor. The story passed down to me was that my mother gave up her career when she married my father. And I don't think she signed on believing that was the plan. She told me that early in their marriage, it became clear that it wasn't practical for there to be more than one actor in the family. And that according to her, my dad quote, needed it more. I felt her unspoken request for a kind of undivided attention intuited that I somehow owed her that at least, which put me in a bit of a jam because it really bugged me. So that's how she feels about her mom. (laughs) I have to pretend that I love birthday parties because otherwise she'll be sad. (laughs) Ugh, My mom is so needy because she had to give up everything as demanded by my father, who's perfect. 
I can't believe my mom is sad that she had to like sacrifice her whole passion just to give me a good life because of my dad made her. Anyway, my dad's an angel. Then she has this weird chapter about the nannies in her life. She has this nanny, Nellie, who then seems to live with her father to this day. And I'm like, she never comes up again. Except for like randomly in the car on the way home from like the Golden Globes. This to me felt like... I'm going to call it a bachelorette chapter. I need this person to know they're important in my life. Yeah. So I'll just write them a little chapter. In seventh grade, they moved to Malibu. And then there's just this whole Rob esque chapter of naming all the people that were their neighbors. It's hard because none of these names mean a thing to me. So in addition to it already being the type of writing that I'm not riveted by, now she's just name dropping names that have no meaning. The Hagmans. Do you guys know who that is? I guess they were in I Dream of Jeannie. I know that that was a show. It still doesn't mean much to me. And she just talks about their bohemian lifestyle. They had a hot tub. You ever heard of one of those? It was cuckoo bananas and they all smoked weed and just did whatever they wanted. So there was a lot of like nudity and just like overall hippiness happening. And then she tells this story, which is the beginning of her pattern of saying these things. And you're like, draw a conclusion, finish the story. What are you telling me? Because it seems like you're telling me something fucked up. I need you to finish the story. So she talks about one of her neighbor, the Hagman's good friends was Henry Fonda, who she explains was Jane Fonda's dad's nephew. And you're like, got it. Famous person. He comes into the house and he looked like a rock star with bright blue eyes, set about conducting a little experiment with me, demonstrating subtle body energy transfer. He instructed me to sit down on the Persian rug facing him with our legs fully extended, the soles of our feet flexed perpendicular to the floor, only a few inches apart. And he told me to close my eyes, which I did, proving to be worthy of this adult attention. I wanted to feel this mysterious energy and I could kind of feel a warm surging sensation on the bottom of my feet, along with also feeling unsure I should even be having this interaction with a grown man. But I figured since Peter was like family to Larry, who was my dad's best friend, I shouldn't be so uptight. I needed to loosen up and relax. What happened here? That's the end of the chapter. Then we just go to a different chapter where she played spin the bottle in middle school. And I'm just like, okay, I need you to draw a conclusion here. What happened next? You just like went foot to foot with some strange man. Here's the thing is when you're reading fiction, you're just like, yes, you can say a story and have it have an ambiguous conclusion. And then we can draw that conclusion. But you are a real person. And I need you to tell me how you felt in this moment, because I don't want to assume that you were harmed by this person in your life. If you're not going to say that, like, I don't want to say like, oh, people were hurting you. If you don't tell me first, it's very ambiguous. And you're telling me your life story. It's not enough to just give me a series of events. You need to be giving me more. Like, what is your conclusion? How did this make you as a person? Are you using this story to give an example of a one-off bad thing that happened to you? Or are you using this as an example of like the constant neglect that your lifestyle, your family's lifestyle left you in? It's just, did something else happen? It's just like a weird story. It's just this, some stoner dude was just like, hey, kids, sit on the floor. Do you feel that? Like, it could range from so innocent to so harmful. And it, I need you to tell me what happened and why you're telling me this. Yeah, I don't feel like it's fair to expect the reader to like put a conclusion on this because of the implications of what every different conclusion could mean. Yes. So then she goes to middle school. They play spin the bottle. She's talking to a friend of hers. They're getting ready to go to this party where it's pretty assured that there's going to be making out happening. And her friend is so nervous. And she's like, don't be nervous. I kiss a ton. And her friend is like, who have you kissed? And she was like, I don't know. This is a weird sentence. She says, I'd been busy kissing boys, loads of boys for years. When she asked me point blank who I'd kissed, I racked my brain but couldn't come up with a single name or face. I just assumed I had kissed plenty. I don't know if it was because I'd been exposed to so much coming from a big city. I just felt more worldly. And I don't know if this is weird, but I could have sworn I'd kissed plenty of people. That is weird. Okay. If there's one thing I know for sure, it's that when you're in middle school, that have versus have not been kissed identity is very important. And there's no question about it. And you are very much keeping track of whether or not you have kissed somebody. And so for her to be like, yeah, I kiss all the time. Oh, I guess I haven't. That is weird. So reading a sentence like that, Two pages after she had this weird interaction with a man, I was like, am I supposed to draw this conclusion that all these weird things had been happening to you? Like, why are you so unsure of your own physical boundaries this young in life? And like when they've been crossed. I don't know. I feel like to put those two stories back to back, I'm like, she's not a strong writer. And so you don't know what you're supposed to glean from it. Yeah. So then she goes to this party and she kisses a bunch. And that's that. She tells this brief interlude about how her mom was very beautiful and took care of herself and was very invested and always looking nice. And we spent one summer in Connecticut. The air was humid and thick. And my mother said, your brother is beautiful. You are interesting looking. 
I was 13 years old. I have no recollection of the context or what prompted her assessment or if I had even ventured to ask her opinion, but I do remember it knocking the wind out of me. I knew my mom loved me and if she was just stating an unequivocal fact, which it seemed that she was, I certainly don't think that there was ever any conscious malice behind it, but it's almost all I can tell you about that summer. I think it's important to note that her brother was adopted. So she yes. has this little brother that she doesn't really talk much about throughout the whole book, except for that. She says how close they were and how they were like overall a very close knit family. But I don't know. Once she turned 18, she sees them not often. So I think she is trying to constantly say that her mom was disappointed with her not being more beautiful. But it's buried in here. If you were to read the book for yourself, like when you're reading it, these are the things that I highlighted as I went through because I was like, oh, that is a moment. But they're not necessarily weaved in in this obvious pattern it's just those two moments of she claims her mom says you should get a nose job and then she says her mom calls her interesting looking at one point well the thing is this book has a lot of cliffs there are a lot of things that like drive you to the edge of an idea and then you don't know if they're there on purpose or if they're there to be woven into something else and some of them do feel like they continue on throughout the book and some of them just kind of dangle some of them you're like well this should logically be woven into this topic and it never is and you're like how much work am I supposed to be doing here like what did you want me to get from this so when you're sitting there staring with like a hundred loose threads it is confusing about which ones you're supposed to be tying up as a reader also she doesn't seem to have a ton of self-awareness or as much self-awareness as she thinks so when you're reading it, you're getting a distinctly different feeling than she's trying to put out. And that's what makes it hard. She's obsessed with being like, I was very confident. I was very comfortable being not the prettiest girl in the room, but pretty enough. And I was very happy with that. And then you're like, I don't know that that's true. It does not seem true. She also talks about a crush she has here. And she says, my first drug of choice was romantic fantasy. It fired me up, focused me and gave me a safe place to escape. So one of the patterns in her life is that she is boy crazy. <laughs> and even this is something she's so funny. She has such only girl in the world syndrome. She later literally says, I was so much more boy crazy than the average teenage girl. I was actually very horny. And I'm like, have you met a teenage girl? Well, so this I think is one of the only threads that ties back into anything else because this, I was reading it and I was like, why do you think you're the only horny teenager on the planet? And then because later she starts going to meetings for sex and love addiction, I think she's saying like, I think I was too horny from day one. And like this led to like an insatiable need to like be in relationships and feel loved like she is a serial dater like she constantly has a boyfriend from the time she's like 14 to the time she's like 29 and I think that this is the only thing that gets wrapped up into any sort of conclusion I agree and maybe she is a lick above I just hate this idea that teen girls aren't boy crazy because those bitches are out of their freaking mind didn't you see turning red (laughs) I mean girls are horny as shit they're obsessed have you seen Harry Styles do you know why he's so popular It's not because he's backed by the U.S. Army. It's because he's backed by horny teenage girls. (laughs) Then her family uproots her from California, even though she feels so happy at the school and in her life. Her dad gets a job in New York, so they're moving back to New York. That summer, they go to Europe. And on the way back from Europe, they send her back to California alone to get her braces off. There are no orthodontists in New York, I think. She's flying to Los Angeles alone. And she refuses to drink a Coke on the airplane, even though that's all she wants because her parents don't drink soda. And she says, I have this inner watchdog, my parents' opinions and rules. Their approach to everything was my lifeline. I assumed that if I played by their rules, nothing bad could happen to me. And this is another one of those foreshadowing moments where you're like, oh, later she breaks one of the rules and then something bad happens. And that's why she associates everything to her parents' set of rules. I just want to get it out of the way right now. That's not what happens. Like nothing ever really relates back to this line ever. Her parents are not very strict. To me, it was less a foreshadowing and the point that you made earlier that like she really identifies as a good girl, as a child. And this is all out the window by the time she's 14, which I'm always like, if you were breaking the rules by the time you were a teenager, then miss me with your good girl bullshit. Everybody (laughs) was afraid of getting in trouble when they were seven. But she really is like, you don't understand. I love my parents. I never wanted to lie to them. I took so much pride in obeying them. And as Ashley points out, she goes, what fucking rules were there in your house? Your dad had no idea what you were doing. Your mom had no idea what you were doing. They had one rule and it was you couldn't have soda. And you followed that rule. But that breaking that rule is not a domino that leads to any other chain of events. The fact that there were no rules overall that's the problem is the problem yeah it's funny to be like I never got in trouble once and it's like of course you didn't you're right now on a plane alone because your parents after you got back from your European vacation decided to take another vacation alone the two of them and could not be bothered taking you to your dentist appointment these were not strict people so she's headed to California alone 
to stay with her grandparents and they're going to take her to the orthodontist. She goes out to lunch with a friend of hers, a boy that she had a crush on and it didn't go anywhere. And she comes back to her grandparents' house and they had the previous day introduced them to their super, who they said is the greatest man. So she gets back to their house after this lunch with a boy. She rings their doorbell. They are not letting her in. They can't hear the doorbell. They don't know what's going on. So she's like, I'll just go to the super's house and ask him for help. So she goes downstairs and he assaults her. She calls her grandparents. And after she gets off the phone, he he pins her arms behind her back and starts kissing her neck. And it's very clear that he will go forward. And she kind of goes into this fight or flight mode where she starts screaming at him and goes, what is wrong with you? Are you fucking kidding me? Is this the only way you can get this? You're pathetic. You can't get someone your own age to have sex with you. So you go after a 14 year old girl. I just hung up the phone. My grandparents are waiting for me upstairs. You're going to get fired. You're so fucked. Out of fear, he kind of hears her and leaves her alone and she runs out. Right. And then she goes upstairs and calls her dad crying and her dad does not have sympathy for her. After a beat, he responded, standing strangely cold and detached. Well, what did you expect? You were probably all juicy from your date with Steve. Wait, he couldn't have said that. There was no way my dad could have meant what I thought he said, that I had only myself, my horniness, my natural God-given desire to blame for this creep attempting to molest me. I was filled with shame as well with a healthy dose of disgust. I was my dad's little girl. And then her grandparents are like, no, he wouldn't have done that. I don't know why you're making that up. She's constantly talking about how close her family is, how tight-knit, how wonderful, how great they are. The first time she's ever needed them for anything, they are not there. There's never been any question in my mind that my grandparents were crazy about me and that my dad loved me beyond words. Yet how does the psyche reconcile the discrepancies? I felt perhaps I must have been somehow at fault or else I've been mistaken about the entire event. Why else would the people I trusted most in the world disappoint me so profoundly? On another much deeper level, I had to have made a subconscious mental note. I couldn't ever count on anyone, even if I was in real trouble. And this is like a horrible story, of course. I mean, what the super did to her. And then more importantly, I think the way that her father turned his back on her and the fact that her grandparents didn't believe her and took this random man's side. I mean, it's a really fucked up story. But there never seems to be in the rest of the book an acknowledgement of how this would affect you. Outside of that one line where she goes, I must have made a subconscious recognition that I can't trust anybody. She continues to say, my father and I are so close. My father and I have always been so close. It doesn't seem to create a noticeable notch on their relationship. So then we get into her high school years. They were saucy. She has this line about how her brother, who was adopted, it seems like he had a hard time with their family because they were so anxious and... I don't know. It's unclear what she's trying to say because she doesn't say anything really. But she says, as a little boy, my brother was prescribed Ritalin. And for a while, my mother even hired this older kid as a manny to help him. Maybe there was a family he would have done better with. I can't help but wonder if perhaps another kind of family with a more stable, less chaotic lifestyle, a family that could and would have adapted to him and his needs might have been a better fit for his sensitive soul. So for a long time, I just assumed that the way our family functioned was no big deal for me. I think I minimized that going to eight different schools, constantly being uprooted, living in six or seven different homes as a kid might have been hard on me. I developed a certain pride in my resilience and adaptability. Wherever we were, whatever the challenge was, I could handle it, I thought. So she really puts a lot of pressure on herself to be her dad's little girl, like to be just like him. And that's obviously why she got into acting in the first place. And I think that instead of saying, okay, this was not like the life for a child. She says, this is not the life for that child. I'm fine. Yeah. I don't think any child would benefit from moving a ton and being uprooted constantly. No. I don't think there's one kid that that would be good for. And so she's just telling all these kind of collection of odd stories about her upbringing. The first time she smokes weed is with her dad. She hates it. So that I couldn't separate the feeling of being high from the feeling of being high with my dad. What I experienced might have been your garden variety paranoia, but at the time, all I wanted was to get the hell away from him thinking this is just wrong. She's failing at school. She's at Dalton, which is where J no, not where JFK Jr. went, but where his group of people went. She's doing really badly. She's struggling, having come from this like hippie dippy California school. So she ends up transferring to Eunice. And then she transfers back to Dalton for her junior year. She is just like hopping around. And I think that there is never really an acknowledgement of as much as it is chaotic, it's also deeply privileged. The fact that you can just like bop in and out of some of the most renowned private schools is not (laughs) common. In the 70s, I think there was no rules. (laughs) Maybe. I do think in the like 70s were lawless. She's talking about the way that she's always throughout her entire life been very attracted to gay men And then because she's always going down 
with her friends to like party in the Bowery and live this very New York-y childhood with no rules. She says that she and her friends would always go party at these gay bars and said, I didn't fully appreciate why I might have been so attracted to the overt sexuality of gay men or why I resonated so strongly with them. But now I can see that the world they inhabited was where I could let my freak flag fly because I felt distinctly different from girls my age, more highly awake sexually. She also says, for me, my aggressive pursuit had a built-in safety net. There was no risk because there was no chance of anything happening between us. But why was I so much more powerfully drawn to them than any straight boy my age? Was it because of the impossibility of my feelings? Or were gay men what I was programmed to be attracted to for some unconscious reason? I don't know. So just put a pin in that. (laughs) Because I have a gander. I have a Freudian gander. So then she talks about getting her first set of headshots. She says, I never considered becoming anything other than an actor. And I... Again, like we've already discussed, I think it's because it was the only job she knew of. I don't think she's ever really interrogated why outside of familiarity. So she wants to become an actor. Her parents are not going to let her start acting until after she's done with high school. That is a rule. One of the only rules they've set is that you cannot begin acting until after high school. But she begs and begs and begs and they let her get a commercial agent when she's 15 years old. And I also want to point out that she was not doing theater or any high school acting. She wasn't allowed to take professional acting classes, but she took dance and voice lessons. But as Ashley said, was she forbidden from doing a school play? This is the question to every parent who puts their child to work if they loved acting so much was there not a community theater (laughs) I'm sure that Dalton had theater her parents say you know what 15 years old we're actually going to scratch the 18 rule we're going to let you get a commercial agent so she gets a commercial agent and her first set of headshots which she hates and writes like a little love letter to her 15 year old self who exists in that headshot. The road ahead was going to be rocky, but also super fun. It's going to take a while, but someday you'll come to understand so much more, feel so much more solid and much more comfortable in her skin, much more beautiful than she could possibly know, but not in the way she would be able to fathom at the moment and that it would all be worth it. (laughs) You had no idea you were going to get a nose job, but you will. Anyway, so now we're going to get into her loss of virginity. I will also say that in addition to the privilege in these pages and like the nepotism, there is like this pompousness about growing up in New York that she... She like does not even try to hide. She's like, no, I am cooler than you because I grew up adjacent to so many cool things. Well, this whole book is her being like, well, of course my life story is interesting. My friend knew JFK Jr. You're going to want to hear this. This line, I think, perfectly encompasses it. She says, the start of a new season often prompted New Yorkers to hit the stores to pick up a few new key pieces to freshen up their winter wardrobes. That's not New York specific. You don't have to be a New York fashion icon to say it's getting chilly out maybe I'll buy a new sweater also this whole little intro is to set up where she meets the guy she loses her virginity to which is he works in a retail store and I'm like we weren't gonna question why you were in there she's like why was I buying clothes because when you're from New York City you have to understand (laughs) the phrase back to school shopping has become so prominent that Old Navy bases their entire year's schedule around it. Is that true? I don't know, but they do a lot of back-to-school ads. <laughs> <laughs> so one day, she's perusing the merchandise, and she saw an extremely cute guy in horn-rimmed glasses. I was 15 and a half, but that didn't stop me from brazenly flirting with this guy, clearly well into his 20s. Yikes. So she goes home with him, takes a taxi to his friend's house, has sex with him, never tells him that she was a virgin, even though they dated for a full year. So she dates him, and then she goes on to, in 1976, she was 16 and a half, she starts dating her hairdresser, Vincent Tribbiani, a 24-year-old hairdresser and rising star in the magazine editorial world. She also does this whole backstory about how there was this movie called Shampoo, and that's why she was so attracted to her hairdresser, and it's like, you could just be attracted to a hairdresser. I guess it was the thing back then. Ladies, if you're from the 80s, call in and let us know if there's a real hot straight men who are hairdressers moment in the 80s. She gets really good haircuts from him. And she does call out that this is really fucked up that she was a teenager dating this adult man. But no one in her life seemed to really think this was a problem. She was like, my parents thought it was a little weird, but he gave them free haircuts. So they were cool with it. She doesn't mention at all that it was weird that she was dating the guy that she met in the sweater store when he was in his 20s and she was 15. This is deeply predatory and she like mentions that the hairdresser was predatory but not the first guy i think she gives the first guy a pass because it sounds like he probably didn't know how old she was for a year though they dated it never came up <laughs> <laughs> he never said where are you going at seven thirty a.m with books <laughs> but anyway so she starts dating this adult man hairdresser and they would party after school she would go over to his house they would do coke get drunk go to studio 54 or the studio as they called it 
and then stay out all night just like doing coke and getting fucked up and then she would go back to his apartment and shower and go to school how does such a darling girl growing up with all her earthly needs met adored by her parents a girl with so much spunk and moxie find herself in situations i wouldn't wish on my worst enemy the adults not on the receiving end of my risky behaviors were i'm sure scared for me my parents didn't really have any idea of the kind of trouble i was up to and though they weren't thrilled with my current romantic situation they didn't feel like they had any recourse this is what's so weird to me about this book and like the lack of true analysis or introspection is when she's like, isn't it crazy that me with the perfect parents and family ended up in a bad situation? And it's like, oh, the girl who was moved by coastally her whole life and seemed to have parents who did not watch her and kind of neglected her ended up in the bad. No, this actually seems exactly like how it would have gone. Yeah. She says, when I try to imagine my own daughter at 16 playing house, essentially living with a grown ass man, doing tons of blow, popping quaaludes and going to studio, not to mention being lied to, cheated on and then gifted with various and sundry STDs and unwanted pregnancies. It makes me physically ill. What? (laughs) See, this is what I mean about like always with the Barry lead and like no analysis of the things you want to hear more about. How two paragraphs ago when you were talking about the kind of nights you were having, were you just barefoot on a city street eating Nothing's diner food? more fun to a 16 year old girl. Anyway, I was doing drugs and I felt out of control and I was scared and I got pregnant multiple times. It sounds like where, what happened with those pregnancies? Like these, it's crazy the way that it's just left unanswered. No teenager should be swimming in the waters that dark at the mercy of grown men who know better. But when you're a 16-year-old girl, nobody's going to tell you to put your clothes on and go home to your parents. I survived these soul-crushing indecencies by minimizing them, dusting off my broken self, thinking, hey, I brought this on myself. I thought I could handle some of the gnarliest, most messed up shit. In retrospect, that naivete simply breaks my heart for my younger self. I thought of myself as an adult. The last thing I wanted to be was a child. I guess I just don't understand how she doesn't see her parents' fault in this. Yes. And I wonder if this is the other end of the thread from like the parties in Malibu where she touched feet with that man. Like she was treated like an adult so young that she was like, I'm an adult and I can do what I want and I'm strong enough to be whatever I want. But I don't know that she's ever going to draw that conclusion or that she's even trying to. She's very much just in the river of her own life, drifting along, wondering how we got here. So then she goes to acting school after high school. She had no intention of going to college because all she wanted to do was be an actor. She auditions for Juilliard and they were like, why would you get into Juilliard? You've never acted before. She's like, uh, looking back, I guess I should have really practiced a monologue or something. I just showed up and tried. She has this weird way of acting like she has had no insight into how the industry worked. There was no way for her to find out information. And I'm like, why not just ask anybody? I like weirdly feel like her dad really didn't want her to become an actress. As she gets older and as she starts to pursue acting, her dad, it seems like, becomes a little bit cold towards her. He doesn't offer a lot of encouragement or a lot of information, and it doesn't seem like they talk about her career very much at all. And I think that that's because being an actor made him special in the center of his family unit. And so having another actor in the family, I think, separated that and, like, let her into a world where he had created a separate version of himself. So she ends up going to the Neighborhood Playhouse School of Theater, which is actually where her mom went. So her mom went with Steve McQueen. And Meisner was actually there teaching her. Anyway, so she goes. She's the youngest person to ever be accepted. I think this to her is the telltale sign that she truly is talented She gets in, and as is true of all acting schools, their whole MO is to just break you in fucking half emotionally. It's absolute psychological warfare in there. So they figure out what your number one insecurity is, and they attack you for it. For her, it was, are you spoiled? That I was the daughter of somebody famous preceded me into every room, without permission, without having anything to do with me. Always somebody's daughter first, never myself. Was being my dad's daughter the most valuable thing about me? Yes. (laughs) At the playhouse, my snake of a teacher hissed confidently, looking for his target. My profound and secret stash of shame and worthlessness. Bullseye. I do wonder if she got in because of her parents. She never once credits having a famous, successful dad with a lick of her success. And I'm like, but that surely can't be true. I guess I went out and just got her point blank, a commercial agent. And then the other thing that I want to say is I think that one of the reasons that this didn't work is because she doesn't think she's like a Nepo baby. I don't think she thinks she's spoiled. I think she thinks her real insecurity is her face. Well, I think she's insecure about not being recognized as her own person, but I don't think to her that's the same thing as being spoiled. Right. She's like a Kendall Jenner in that she's like, actually, my name holds me back. Yes. (laughs) Literally. She's like, how hard is it to be known as an Oscar winner's daughter? And I don't think ever once in these pages did she ever say, and of course it was a bit easier for me because I was an Oscar winner's daughter and I knew a lot of people in the industry and I was 
eating dinner with Barbara Walters when I was five. Anyway. So she graduates from this two-year conservatory. She's like, I'm the youngest person to ever graduate. You're not allowed to audition while you're in there. But the minute she gets out, she hits the ground running, auditions for everything, and books nothing. Yes. She also talks about how everyone was kind of worried. So this is where I think her nose comes into play with her family. I don't think that they don't think she's beautiful. I think that they think if she's going to be successful in acting, she needs to look more conventional. And then Meryl Streep becomes famous. And she's like, wow, finally, a golden ray of sunshine to light the way of a weird nose gang. She was everything my, po- my parents hoped I'd be. This Meryl had a prominent nose. I could barely notice her brilliance, barely be wowed by her seemingly infinite range. I couldn't see that she was the second coming. All I saw was that beautiful, aquiline, prominent nose. Wow. Finally, someone was successful in spite of having a less conventional nose. And all I could see was the nose. She then tells this wild story about when she was 20, she dated this 38-year-old French billionaire who invited her down to Rio in Brazil for Christmas. And she goes and she gets all coked out and kind of like loses her mind and starts crying because he brings Gilda Radner. And then Gilda Radner is mean to her. And then it turns out Gilda Radner was there to like fuck her boyfriend and left. Was there to fuck the billionaire, but also had a boyfriend. And so then Jennifer Grey is like, please don't be mad at me, Gilda Radner. You can have the billionaire. And Gilda Radner is like, I honestly don't know why I'm here. I kind of feel like the subtext is Gilda Radner is like, I didn't know he'd be fucking a 20 year old. That like gave me the ick. (laughs) Yeah, I think this was the beginning of a pattern of her having absolutely crystal clear clear signs that she was being cheated on or she was the side chick and just not picking up on it it seems like this billionaire invited a lot of people down to brazil for christmas and only her and gilda were dumb enough to come and only she was stupid enough to stay yeah so now she gets into her acting career her first gig is she becomes a understudy for some hot play that kevin bacon is in she also says the reason she was the understudy is because the characters were a popular girl and a weird girl and she was too weird to be the popular girl but too pretty to be the weird girl so she was cast as the understudy for both and this is i think her acknowledging how bad she is at acting without recognizing she's saying how bad she is at acting right without knowing that she's bad at acting because (laughs) i don't think being the popular girl or the weird girl is a look i think it's a vibe and the fact that she cannot have that vibe is bad acting i mean if you look at me a thermopolis anybody can look any way anyone can look any way the other thing is if you're on a broadway stage you don't have a to have a perfectly symmetrical face they just say you're beautiful people are far away they don't know if you just act beautiful you can be beautiful so she has her first acting gig as the understudy for both of the female leads actually and the night that she finally gets to go on and play somebody She has like a full on mental breakdown. In this haze of adrenaline overload, I had my first out of body experience. Years later, I would understand this to be a kind of panic attack, a dissociative state that you feel when you've gone suddenly mad where everything looks distorted and unfamiliar. At one point, I remember looking down at these strange, unfamiliar white shorts and wondering whose legs those were. She doesn't say it here, but later in the book, she refers to this moment as the day she swore off doing live acting or theater work. And I'm just like, Okay, what did you think you were doing here? It is so fucking crazy that she has no interest in acting and she can't hack it. So in her auditions, she is not good enough for the role. They cast her as the understudy. When she gets on, she realizes that she cannot act in front of people, but she still continues to pursue acting. And so then someone asked her to come in as a favor because for this Francis Ford Coppola movie, they're doing some table reads and someone couldn't make it. So she's filling in in like the table read in the rehearsals and then someone else ends up dropping out and she gets cast in the movie as like a smaller role and she's on set for ages I guess Francis Ford Coppola shoots in the least efficient way possible and then when the movie comes out she's in like a second of it there's also a lot of reasons why her scenes weren't that good well it had been a really long day her scene was last her scene partner Nick Cage left without reading with her like there's always a reason why it wasn't as good as it should have been yeah and so then they see the movie she's barely in it and she like is asking her dad for a compliment and he like can't give her one because I think she's just really bad in it but also that's mean of her dad yeah it's mean of her dad but her dad doesn't want her to be an actress yeah but you could yeah but her dad's mean and cold yeah and she's constantly like my dad is my best friend and it's like well in every story you've told in this book he's like either straight up cruel and bad at being a dad and ignoring you after you were sexually assaulted or he's just being mean to you as you pursue what you think are your dreams or he's just ignoring you 
There's a lot of talk of what a great man he was and how much she idolized him and how much she loved him. There's not a lot of examples of it. So then she's in some action flick with Patrick Swayze. They do not get along. She hates him. He's always pranking her. She has two big scenes. One's a love scene. One's a death scene. The love scene, Patrick Swayze shows up so drunk. That they cancel the scene. And then her big death scene the night before, he like lights fireworks in her room or something to make her afraid and she can't sleep. And so then she's like, I was really bad because I hadn't slept the night before. And it's like, or were you bad at acting? I will say that's on Patrick Swayze. He like fucked over both of those scenes. He did fuck over both of those scenes, but there's always a reason why every time she's ever been on screen, it hasn't been that good. When the Francis Ford Coppola movie finally comes out, she says, what'd you think? He goes, well, it was all over the place and very long. Ultimately, not really satisfying. I blurted out, but what did you think about me? Well, you know, there wasn't, I mean, it's hard to tell. And almost protectively, they really didn't give you much to do. To my mind, my dad was the arbiter of all things. He has always been extremely candid and vocal about what was, in his opinion, good, and I had fashioned my opinions and tastes after his. He suddenly, uncharacteristically, had no opinion. Unwilling to let it go, I began feeding him what I wanted to hear. My takeaway from that evening was, the one thing I know for a fact is that my dad loves me more than anyone in this world. If there was anything good to possibly say, he would have said it. At least I can trust him to tell me the truth. Which is honestly probably true. So then she gets cast in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, which is a really big deal, but she is like in a really bad mood that day. And also doesn't really give a shit about who John Hughes is. She didn't like 16 Candles. So she went in and since Jeannie Ferris Bueller's sister is such a bitch and she was acting like such a bitch, she got the role. And she was just like going through a hard time in her life. So she's like acting like a rageful bitch was like very easy for me. So then she goes and films it. Her and Matthew Broderick have a little romance on set. And then they date for two years. She's in his room one day and he gets a call and he shushes her. And when she asks who that is, And why she would have to be quiet in the background, he goes, it's just a family friend. Don't worry about it. This begins another pattern that was quite obvious to anybody who wasn't her. I mean, this one she acknowledges is very obvious. When she's writing about how often Matthew Broderick was cheating on her, she's like, I'm sure you're shocked that I haven't figured it out yet. The night before my audition for Dirty Dancing, I begged Matthew to come out with me to Heartbreak, a club just below Canal Street in Tribeca where you could dance to music from the 50s and 60s. But Matthew wasn't in the mood. I don't even blame him. He's allowed to not want to go dancing. What's crazy to me is that she never once takes auditions seriously. Well, I think that was her taking the audition seriously. She's like, I'll practice my dancing before my audition. Anyway, she goes in. She does a dance audition and she nails it. She brings her own music. She freestyles and it all works out. Then they have her do chemistry tests with the potential male leads And Patrick Swayze comes in and she's like, no, I fucking hate this guy. And they were like, no, but he's a really good dancer. And she was like, fine. And then he was a really good dancer. So he gets cast and then she goes on to explain the horror show that was shooting this movie. It was a really small budget production. Everything went wrong. There was mosquitoes. It was cold. People kept leaving. Crew members kept quitting. The outfit sucked. She had to refigure out the outfits. Yeah. I don't think she likes the process of making a film at all and she's like as bad as it was for me I'm sure it was worse for everyone else (laughs) yeah and she is like you know I me and Patrick Swayze the reason the movie was good is because there was tension between us the point of the movie is that these two characters have tension she also says this role was written for her because the two were so similar they were both daddy's girls Jewish from New York City young good girls They had very similar fathers. She was just like, if I didn't get this role, I was never going to get any role. And so then I guess she did get this role, but then like there was never a second identical role. (laughs) That's the thing is the two roles that she's now gotten that are notable happen to just be really perfect for her. Like it just happens to be a one-two punch of things that are exactly right. It doesn't seem like she wowed anybody with her ability to transform into a character. She's not a vessel. So there's a sex scene in the film and she had already said, no nudity, which to her meant no nipples, no butt crack. She goes to shoot it and she wanted to keep her underwear on because they're under the sheets and they insist that she has to take it off. And she was very nervous. And so she tries to explain how she reclaims control and power in this situation. And instead of talking about the way she claims control and power, she kind of uses it as a way to give advice to younger actors that I think is really bad advice. And I think it's fair to say like this was my mental gymnastics in this situation. I don't like the way she says, and you should do this too. The scene wasn't happening to me. It was happening for me. I'd make it a good thing, a very good thing. The more they watch, the more I'd get off on it. So that's what I did. Whenever young actresses ask me about shooting love scenes, I basically tell them, just turn yourself on. Do whatever it takes to feel you're in the power position because you are. No one's taking anything from you that you don't want to give. 
I don't know if that's true. I think the whole problem with sex scenes in movies is that very often things are being taken from actresses that they do not want to give. Like in this scene, she wanted to keep her underwear on. They said, no, you can't. Now they have intimacy coordinators. They have people whose job it is is to be on set and make sure the actor and actress in the scene are comfortable. I don't think saying like you're the only one looking out for yourself, so get yours is right. It just doesn't even make sense to me. I don't understand what it is that she's advocating for. She's advocating for like gaslighting yourself into thinking you're in control. She then ends it with talking about how she wishes she could see Patrick Swayze one more time to tell him like, I'm sorry for how judgmental I was and not accepting you for yourself. And you were the perfect partner for me. And the success we had obviously was because of both of us. And so thank you for your position. We then go a bit back in time and she talks about going home for her brother's high school graduation. And she talks about this memory where they brought a photographer to take photos of all of them and everybody was in a bad mood. You know kids those age. They're grumpy. And they're all like, why do we have to take all these happy family photos? Blah, blah, blah. And it turns out it's because the very next day she goes to see her mom and her mom just says, I just can't do it anymore. They never really quarreled or not that I had witnessed. They were so similar. They would say almost the same words to me on separate occasions. They liked and referenced the same things. They echoed each other's every thought. They were joined at the fucking hip. They had been married for 24 years. As I was growing up, it had never occurred to me that they would get divorced. But when I heard the words, I can't do it anymore, somewhere deep within me, I understood exactly what she meant. She was tired of being Mrs. Joel Gray. She was making a last-ditch effort to reclaim herself. She even says just before, my parents' style was probably more my dad's vision, but because they had been married so long, their partnership so enduring, their sensibility in lockstep, it was hard to tell where one of them ended and the other began. It's like she's always talking about how similar her parents are and then having these like little almost realizations that her mom never got to discover who she was. In the meantime, she's dating Matthew Broderick, who is constantly cheating on her. She tells a story about going to visit him on some film set, and the day before she's supposed to visit, he's like, don't come. My co-star is obsessed with me, and she says she'll quit if you show up. And she's like, bizarre. I'll go anyway, and she shows up. She's talking about having pizza with her roommate, being like, what do you think he means when he says don't come? Why would he say don't come? What do you, what do you think is the context? I mean, the running thread throughout the relationship is he's constantly cheating on her on these movies, which makes sense because he cheated with her on a movie. But so then she flashes back to in New York, I guess Matthew and his mom, Patsy, are very, very close. She's an actress and a playwright and she's from New York City and she looks down on the big Hollywood hubaloo or whatever. Like She thinks she's better than everybody. I don't know. For some reason, she's always calling her looking for Matthew, even though Matthew doesn't live with his mom. So she calls the mom. And the mom is like in horrible pain. She's a widow, so she's by herself. And so Jennifer runs over to try to help her. They're chatting for a little bit. And then finally she goes, well, your dad's gay. I kind of laugh it off and correct her. No, um, he's not. He's gay, she said. He actually isn't. But then her frustration seemed to focus her. How can you not know your dad's gay? He's always been. Everybody knows but you and your mom, but it's not her fault. It was like a sniper attack. And she's like, why is she doing this to me? Does she just hate that I'm dating Matthew? She must be wanting to make me mad and make me leave. What a fucking bitch. So then she calls her parents and her dad sits down with her, her brother and Nellie, who was their nanny. And she just goes, we had a conversation. I don't remember what the conversation was about, but I remember when I asked Nellie later about it, she just goes, I know that your brother had a harder time with it than you did. And you're reading this book being like, okay, what was the conversation? Like she never says what the conversation was about, which I find odd. And you can assume what the conversation was about, but she won't say it. And then she goes, my dad's sexual preference, or anyone's for that matter, is not for me to understand or define. I think her dad has defined it. Humans are complicated and sexuality is shrouded in mystery for many of us. And so you're reading this going, okay, so like maybe he was, who knows? Everything is a spectrum. And then she goes down and says, Many years later, by penning a memoir, Master of Ceremonies, my dad came out at the age of 82. From that book, I learned that after confessing a homosexual relationship to his parents at the age of 16, his mother turned to him and said, you disgust me. From his point of view, being an openly gay man in the 50s would have rendered his desires to have a family of his own and become a successful actor in possibilities. Her dad has since come out explicitly. And for some reason, she's just like, who's to say what he is? And then she goes on to be like, he still says that my mother is the love of his life. So who can really say what his sexuality is? And it's like, well, him, he said he was gay. It's very odd the way she handles this subject because it seems like she has not yet come to terms with it. And now scooching back to when she says, it's odd that I'm always attracted to gay men. You're like, maybe not. (laughs) Are these threads connected to you? Because they're connecting for me. She currently attends meetings for sex and love addiction. And she seems to tie this back to her like overly sexual use. She says from an early age, it was very clear that I was more sexual than my peers. I think she thinks that is why 
she was attracted to spending a lot of time with the gay community and not the fact that she loved and was obsessed with her dad and her dad was a member of the gay community. Yeah, it's just odd the way she talks about it. Especially because it seems very reductive to be like, oh, gays are overtly sexual and I'm overtly sexual, so that's why we got along. It's like, no. First of all, I think she only wrote a memoir because he wrote a memoir. The minute I saw that her dad had a memoir, I go, oh, that's why I'm reading this fucking piece of shit. Because <laughs> you're still trying to live in his footsteps despite the fact that like there's no reason for you to. But for him to come out in his memoir as gay and have her be like, who's to say where he falls on the spectrum? And it's like... He's to say. He said. He told you. Okay, so now her relationship with Ferris Bueller has gotten more serious. We're back to present day. Her and her agent go to watch the rough cut of Dirty Dancing to make sure that the nudity was... Wasn't too much. And it turns out it was too much. They, they had gone against specifically what she had asked. And her agent's response was just, whatever, let him have it. Nobody's going to see this movie. Her agent hates her. Now we are in Ireland with Matthew Broderick. We have talked about this incident several times, most recently on the Patreon like two weeks ago. I had no idea Jennifer Grey was there. So they're dating. Matthew Broderick's family had a house in Ireland and they go there all the time. He was raised there. They vacationed there. She is in Ireland with him for a lover's week before her movie premieres. She gets there. They're fighting the whole time. She kind of can't stand him. She's like, we're going to break up as soon as we get home. And he goes, my mom's coming to visit. And she obviously hates his mom and is like, well, if she's coming, I'm out of here. And he's like, no problem. I'll drop you off at the hotel tomorrow. So they're driving. And as they're driving down the rainy Irish roads, they have a head-on collision with a mother and a daughter in another car. The car flips. He's like strapped in there. She is okay. She's able to get out. Of course, she withstands whiplash and a lot of... Yeah, she eventually finds out that she had very serious whiplash, but it doesn't affect her so much for like another couple of years. His leg completely snaps. He has a couple other injuries. She's like trying to manage the situation, trying to like find someone to help them. She's like running up the road looking for help and trying to get Matthew out of the car. Somehow she doesn't realize that there was another car involved. She hears about it on the news and she hears that two people died in a car accident. And when she asks the nurse were those the two people in our car accident? The nurse goes, oh, no, 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 those other two people are fine. They walked out of here, which is a lie. A flat-out lie. So Matthew Broderick was driving a car in Ireland. Two people died, and then he was investigated for, like, manslaughter, basically. But the charge ended up being degraded to, like, careless driving, and he ended up only having to pay, like, 100 pounds. I do wonder if it was his fault. I mean, I don't know, car accidents happen. In this book, according to her... It was absolutely an accident. They were on unknown roads and it was foggy and I don't know. Anyway, so I I had no idea Jennifer Grey was there. I knew that Matthew Broderick had been driving a car in Ireland at one point and killed someone. I did not know that Jennifer Grey was the passenger. So Dirty Dancing is about to come out. She's in the hospital with him in Ireland. She's, as far as they're concerned at the time, okay. So he, Matthew Broderick is getting all these surgeries and his leg needs a full like reconstruction but she's just walking around his mom comes out first and then her mom comes out and insists that she goes back for the premiere of her movie in new york which matthew broderick insists she does not do he's like you cannot do press for this film he was already anti-press to begin with he wouldn't do red carpets with her he wouldn't do press with her he tried to insist that she doesn't do press and then when this happened he said, basically he says press wasn't something really good actors need to do if you were really good you don't need any of that bullshit but meanwhile they had brought dirty dancing to the Cannes Film Festival for some reason, and it was getting rave reviews. People loved it. Like, there was hype up the wazoo. She was shocked because she had been told by her own agent and friends that it sucked. She's like, maybe they recut it, and it's just better now. I've always been pretty fierce when fighting on behalf of others, but less so for myself. I was designed to be that girl. And what could be more enticing to this personality kink of mine than someone who was injured, had nearly died, and was facing an uncertain future? I had no internalized fight for myself. So her mom comes and insists she goes back to the premiere. Matthew Broderick's PR person is like, don't do any press. Don't let them ask you about the car crash. They're going to ask you. You have to avoid it. And finally, her mom insists. She goes, this is everything you've ever worked for. You have to go to your own freaking movie career. So she goes to the New York one, the LA one, and then she hightails it right back to Belfast. And then there's like a whole European press tour that they do that they're like, you literally cannot do that. You were just in like a big European car accident and people are dead. And there's a full on investigation of Matthew Broderick. It will look so bad if you do this press tour so Patrick Swayze does it alone he comes out of Dirty Dancing with quite a lot of heat and she's like oh it's because he did the press and I didn't I think there were a number of reasons again there's another example of her dad is at the premiere and he starts crying and she says dad are you okay what's going on and he just says it's just a lot 
and then he just leaves. <laughs> so she doesn't have a press person for this. And a PR person is somebody that she herself would have had to pay for out of pocket. And she looks back and one of her big regrets is that she didn't have anybody helping her do PR. So she's showing up to the red carpets with clothes she bought at stores. She's not doing any of the interviews. She's not doing really any of the press outside of what's being handed to her by the movie. Meanwhile, Patrick Swayze is like going on talk shows and he has a full time press person by his side helping elevate his status. So he's not just walking out of the movie with heat by coincidence because people like him more. He's walking out of this movie with heat because he has someone pulling the strings. And this is somebody that's worked with him his, his whole career. Meanwhile, Jennifer is like, I wish anybody had given me the advice to get a PR person. I wish somebody had said you should just borrow money or do it if I could go back in time and tell myself. And I'm just like, where was anybody? Like you grew up in show business. No How one told you? you? No. Nobody from the movie told you. And not only did she not know, but like she's sitting here going, well, Patrick Swayze has it. And for some reason, she just chose not to do it for herself. If your co-star visibly has a PR person working for them. At some point, she must have said, should I get one, too? And she just chose not to. Do you know what I mean? She's acting like there was no way for her to get this information. Yeah. So she goes back to the hospital, and she's telling Matthew about all the great reviews she's gotten. He's like, don't tell me about that. I don't want to hear about it. He's very unsupportive. They go back to New York. He's recovering. She says that when things were good, they were good. And when they were awful, they were awful. So it, it feels like they were in just a deeply toxic relationship where... I feel like anyone in that type of relationship is always like when things were good, they were good. But when they were bad, they were bad. And it's like things should never be as bad as they were when they were bad. I obviously believe her. And I think I'm sure he was a huge douchebag control freak. But I think part of why she was in it was because she doesn't want to be an actor. Do you know what I mean? She really, I think, in these couple of chapters makes Matthew Broderick the reason her career never took off. Like she was unable to capitalize on the success of Dirty Dancing because he wouldn't let her do press. But it's also like it's not his fault she didn't have a PR person. But then once he's out of the picture... It's not like things change. I think... Right. Well, because she believes that once he's out of the picture, the heat from Dirty Dancing died down, even though that wasn't true. So she says, in the months after Dirty Dancing... It seemed like everyone wanted to see me for their project, but something was off or out of alignment. Even though I was hurting for cash, I was turning down jobs I was being offered out of fear, fear of not being a good enough actress to overcome subpar material. And when I had an exciting audition for something A-list, I either didn't prepare adequately or got super close to getting it, which happened a lot, but for some reason it didn't make the cut. See, like you can't blame Matthew yeah. Broderick for that. You know what I, mean? I really do think that she talks a lot about how after Dirty Dancing, she would go for these big meetings with big directors and never show up well-rested or prepared. And it's like, well, that's why your career didn't go anywhere. So she ends up taking some play, even though she had sworn off plays. And who should be her co-star but Madonna, who was in the midst of a very high-profile split from her husband, Sean Penn. So she becomes close with Madonna. Then she and Matthew Broderick break up because he's definitely cheating on her holly hunt wait with helen hunt oh she's cheating on with helen hunt is one of those stories where she's at dinner with helen hunt goes home calls matthew he's not there she calls him every half hour until 7 30 a.m at which point she goes to his apartment he's not there when she finally hears from him he's like i was at breakfast with my sister and she was like really at 6 a.m mm -hmm. and then when she breaks into his apartment she finds a photo of helen hunt <laughs> So they finally break up. She has a birthday party thrown for her by Madonna, who gets Alec Baldwin to come because that was Jennifer Grey's current crush. He brought actually his brother, Billy Baldwin. So she starts dating Billy Baldwin for a bit. And then a couple months later, Matthew Broderick just like shows up at her door, actually at the door of her therapist's office. Yeah, he comes into town. He goes, where are you? And she goes, I'm going to therapy. Bye, loser. And then he shows up in there. And he proposes. And she doesn't really know what to do. So she just like gets engaged to him for a little bit and then is like, never mind. After they break up for real this time, she just flees to Los Angeles to sleep at her mom's apartment for a little while. And there, two weeks later, her agent is like, there's this guy, Johnny Depp, that I want you to go on a blind date with. And she's like, I don't think I should be dating right now. And she was like, I guess I don't really care. I want to sign him as a client. And so I need you to be nice to him. So she goes on a date with Johnny Depp. And within two weeks, she and Johnny Depp are engaged. And he's so nice and charming and cool and sweet and smart and perfect. And they love the same cigarettes and they love the same Native American style blankets. And then would you believe it? Very quickly, he becomes insane. He's working in Vancouver. He's very angry. He's flying home all the time to yell at her and be like, what were you doing while I was gone? She's not working at all. She's just like fucking hanging out, living in a house that he bought. She made only $50,000 from Dirty Dancing, and then she doesn't get another role. So she's low-key broke. High-key. High-key broke, living with Johnny Depp. Finally, he just stops kind of responding to her. So one day he comes back to L.A. They're in a hotel together. He goes to a meeting and just never comes back. And it's like hours and hours and she just leaves a note saying like, I'm done. And she goes home. And then shortly after that, she's sitting with her mom at a diner 
And her mom's like, you know, it's easier for Michelle Pfeiffer to get roles because she is just like more photogenic than you. And she's like, okay, I'm going to go get a nose job. So this is the context that's missing from the intro chapter. At this point, she's had two engagements. She is just like spiraling. She's not getting roles. She was engaged to Matthew Broderick and Johnny Depp within the same month. So she is involved in a car accident where people die. She goes to this big movie premiere that's supposed to be her breakout moment, but she's so traumatized from this accident that she's not even taking in any of it. And then she like kind of lets her career just slip away. She has two engagements. She's and a lot of her reasons she lets her career slip away is anytime something good happens, Matthew Broderick won't let her do it. So he won't let her have the same agent as him. She gets hired by Mike Nichols to be in a movie. And he goes, no, that's my director. You can't be in it. And she's like, okay. So anything she does get, she turns down. Anything that is like an opportunity that she should pursue harder, she kind of just doesn't even try that hard at. And then she has these two failed engagements with like lunatics. (laughs) So and then she decides to get a nose job because she is having a bad couple of years. The day before my 29th birthday, I cut the cord from Tracy Jacobs, who was her agent, who was like not getting her anything after Dirty Dancing and was Johnny Depp's agent. I signed with Madonna's agent and I broke off my engagement with Johnny nine months after we met. Then she goes to get the nose job. Two days later. So you cannot tell me that this was some resolute choice she made solemnly because her career required it. She was spiraling. She was spiraling. And the thing is, this whole idea that like the quote from her mom is, you really should go do your nose. It's too competitive out there. It's much harder to photograph you than a Michelle Pfeiffer. It just is. If you want a career, make it easier for them. The thing is, if you want a career, another way to make it easier for them is to like show up, to be prepared, to like try in these meetings. To accept meetings. roles that are being offered to you. Right. She had psyched herself out. She had psyched herself out. She, it wasn't the nose. It was the fact that she didn't want to be an actor. So then she has this rock bottom moment where she's always wanted to be on the Johnny Carson show. The first time she tries to be on it, she does this pre-interview and they basically tell her you're not ready. And she didn't realize that people went in with scripted bits. She thought she could just go in and be candid, which is stupid. And if she had a PR person, they would have helped her. Why didn't her dad tell her this is what it's like to be on Carson? He'd been on Carson. She says after her pre-interview where they don't accept her, she says, maybe I was just not as funny or interesting as I thought I was. Literally, you're not. Or prepared or hardworking. So a year later, she does finally get a PR person who works on like one-off bases. And they get her a second go at it. And luckily, she's coming prepared with all these interesting life stories because... She's been engaged to Matthew Broderick and Johnny Depp, who's like a hot to trot little guy. Yeah. And so she talks about these two engagements and they're like, oh, you're in. So then she goes and on the way there, she's like sick to her stomach thinking that she's going to sell herself out talking about her personal life and she doesn't know how to get out of it. And she's so stressed and she hasn't eaten and she's blacking out and she drinks alcohol and then she gets on stage. Can't remember where she is. The adrenaline is running. She has stage fright, which I'm sorry and I don't want to be a bitch, but if you're a... Afraid of performing. If you are somebody who gets performance anxiety, you probably should not be a performer. You can't be showing up to the Johnny Carson show afraid of live interviews. Yeah, so she gets drunk before the show and then she gets more drunk after the show when she knows that she's bombed because she says Johnny Carson just like looked at her like she should be dead. Well, because she went off script. You know, they have a show that they think they're doing and for some reason in it, she put her hand on his chest and was trying to be flirty and wouldn't say what she said she was going to say and he just did not like it. So then they cut to commercial and when they come back, she's just sitting there crying. She just, she just cried the whole show. And then she had a fucking spiraled. Obviously, I would spiral too. If I was drunk and cried on live TV. I would for sure spiral. But how did this happen? I mean, I feel like when you're from a showbiz family, like how did no one sit down and say like, this is what to expect on Carson? A little bit before this had happened, someone was like, you should come to these meetings that I go to where we talk about sex and relationship addiction. And she was like, interesting. Okay. And so then she starts going to these meetings and she has a sponsor. And after this Carson incident, she calls her sponsor and is like, I just had the worst fucking night. I got so drunk. And the sponsor is like, how often are you doing that? And then they're like, maybe you should go to drug and alcohol meetings too. And she's like, I'm not an alcoholic, but when I think about it, I have not been sober for a single minute (laughs) since I was 14. And she had always been using weed, alcohol, Valium, Xanax, Coke, like anything she needed throughout the day. She was just highs and lows, highs and lows were completely externally pharmaceutically controlled yes so she starts going to those meetings as well and she gets sober just in time for her 30th birthday she says her life becomes a lot better but then she just skips to be like and then I was 40 yeah she's like the thing is if your life gets better when you stop drinking you should keep not drinking and I think she finds herself but it does not seem like she then flourished she said I'd been raised to believe that if you study with the best work your ass off stay true to yourself and when you get that big break and you eventually will because you're talented and hardworking, you'll have the career you've always wanted the life you've always wanted 
I'd never considered being anything other than an actor. I had that singleness of focus. I'd closed off all the exits, had no backup plan. And to be as the female lead in a movie as big as Dirty Dancing and never get a seriously good gig after that, it felt like I'd been dumped on my head by a business I had entrusted as the arbiter of my value. There's a couple of things in here I would question. Perhaps their connection to me as an actress or as baby was inextricably linked to my physical imperfection. So she's talking about all this in the context of like she had everything she wanted, but because of her nose job, she was then essentially blacklisted. I mean, I'm sorry. People get plastic surgery. People look different. People age. They still get roles if they're good at acting. Or even if they keep trying. Yeah. Really, this is a story of someone who did not want to be a part of the game. She didn't want to keep having to audition. She didn't want to keep dealing with rejection. She didn't want to keep dealing with performance. She didn't think she could do it. I mean, the fact that after Dirty Dancing, she turned down certain roles because she didn't think she was a good enough actor to work with some of the material she was given. She just didn't like acting. I mean, even the fact I thought that she was going out and partying the day before auditions, like it was not a priority. No, she wanted a fun life. She didn't want to work hard at a craft. At some point, she meets a man who's writing a sitcom and she ends up playing herself for two roles. And she says, I got her back in L.A. And then she writes the scariest line I've ever seen in my life. The next thing I knew, I was 40 years old. So if you guys remember... Just the other day, she turned 30. (laughs) On her 30th birthday, she got sober, and that was four pages ago. The next thing she knew, she was 40 years old. She skips her entire 30s. She's like, I was in a sitcom at some point. That's As somebody who has just turned 30, as two people in our early 30s that I think look towards this decade as something exciting because we've worked through our 20s and we have a direction and we can't wait to put our foot to the pedal and see where we go next, the idea that an entire decade could just be summed up in a sentence is so nerve-wracking. Also... What happens when she turns 40? She realizes she wants the baby. The guy she's dating, she gets pregnant with. No. She realizes she wants a baby and she's dating like guys who are 15 years younger than her. And she's like, I can't do this. So she starts dating very intentionally to find someone she can have a baby with. She meets a guy that she kind of likes and is like, I can't have sex with you because I'm trying to have a baby right now. And he was like, I'll have a baby with you. Yeah. So they just have a baby. And then they spend 20 years married. What I find interesting about this book is, and we'll get to it, we're right at the end, honestly. The whole conclusion is about like women writing their own stories and empowering themselves and doing what they want and not being stuck in these age-old cycles. And meanwhile, she's written the story of her life, and it only talks about the ways in which she related to men. It seems like in her 30s, she didn't have a serious relationship or there wasn't an important relationship then, and so she skips it. The 30s, which presumably is when she gets sober and starts discovering these things about herself, not a word. She literally goes from being obsessed with her dad to her first boyfriend, to her hairdresser boyfriend, to Matthew Broderick, to Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp. And then there's a decade that she does not mention. And then she has a baby with the man she marries. Where's the journey of finding self? I guess I don't know that she ever found it. So then the rest of this book is about how she loves being a mother and she loves spending time with her kid. I'd had a taste of being pretty famous. And for me, it wasn't so hot. I'd also made money in fits and starts. And that didn't do it for me either. I'd gotten jobs that I liked and jobs that I loved. As an actor, if you're really lucky, once in a blue moon, you get a gig that's pure happiness. But that's pretty rare. Or that's just been my experience so far. To compare her experience with like the craft of acting to like a Viola Davis, a Molly Shannon, even Busy Phillips was like, I loved auditions because it allowed, it was acting and I got to at least do the thing I loved. She doesn't give a shit. She just, it was the life she was accustomed to. When she has this baby, she honestly loves it. And she says she loves being a stay-at-home mom, but I wonder if Ashley thinks she really just loves having an excuse for why she's not trying anymore. And she's like, the minute I had this baby. And I don't, I just want to say, I don't think being a stay-at-home mom means you're not trying. I think that she, this, I think Jennifer Grey was a directionless person who only knew two things and that was being a mother which is what her mom did or being an actor which is what her dad did and being an actor she was obviously not cut out for it she had panic attacks when she was trying to be an actor yeah and I think she was failing and so it was a nice relief for her to be like oh no 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 no. I I quit to be like I'm actually just like wanting to spend time with my child I don't want the life of an actor where you're constantly like leaving for months at a time I want to be with my kid I think when she turned 30, she could be like, oh, I had to quit acting because no one recognized me because of my nose. And now at 40, she was like, why haven't I resumed acting? It's because I'm a mother. So she ends up marrying this man. His name is Clark Gregg. He wrote What Lies Beneath. He's also the star of New Adventures of Old Christine. Of course I watched. I loved New Adventures of Old Christine. And I recognized him immediately. (laughs) They get together. They have this baby. She's so happy. She does Dancing with the Stars, as every memoirist does. Shockingly, she wins. She wants to quit a ton because she has a lot of back problems from 
the car accident that results in surgery, but she perseveres. Her daughter is like, please don't quit, mom. Just do one thing for yourself. And she's like, got it. Her husband goes, I've never seen you happier than when you did that. She also includes the Dancing with the Stars parts that she could be like, my best friend was there every week to cheer me on. You may have heard of her, Jamie Lee Curtis. Do you know a really funny thing? If you look at the book jacket Mm -hmm. and they have like little credits, um, author paragraphs, copyright, whatever, front jacket concept by Jamie Lee Curtis. It's just a picture of her. She had the concept of a photo. Yeah. And here's the thing. Winning Dancing with the Stars, incredible. I've, we've heard from all of them. It's a very hard feat. I actually had no idea she won. I couldn't believe she won. But that was in 2010. <laughs> and then she ends this book and it's like, see, I got myself back. And uh, I just needed to prove to myself that I could. And I'm like, that was 12 years ago. I mean, nothing has happened since she turned 30, it seems. Except for that she got divorced. Yeah, but she doesn't talk about that, really. She has, like, one sentence being like, we spent 19 good years together. That's pretty impressive. And it is. I think a 19-year relationship is really impressive. But there's no information about, like, I don't know. It's very odd. I came from a long line of women who became mothers and wives at the expense of the career they wanted. The stories my mother's mother told was I didn't get to be a pianist. And my mom knew she didn't want to be, like, her depressed mother. So she was going to do it all differently and then gave up her career to be the mother and wife to my father. There was something imprinted on me by my foremothers that I was resolved to outfox. I thought I'd be able to override the system. I decided I'd be like my dad and not my mom and would, not, and would somehow not fall prey to her undesirable epigenetics. And yet, there I was, a domestic goddess mother superior. There had never been a woman in my family lineage who got out from under that destiny. I didn't know how to get out from un- under it either and began to doubt that it could be done. I think she's saying now that she got out of it because <laughs> she got divorced. I mean, this book is... 330 pages she turns 30 on page 271 and she's currently I think 50 she's in her 60s she's in her okay that's a lot of book it ends with I've become willing to tell the truth in the second half of my life like I never had before there's an exhilarating relief in my willingness to face my fear of the unknown the second half of her life she's telling the truth she didn't tell us anything I've relinquished the dollhouse's destination as container of the dream and it's really all the unknown all the time now It's a wild, wild west, baby, with no illusion of the known, the plan, the way it's supposed to look or be. And my excitement about adventure, along with my limitless ability to fantasize myself, is now officially unbridled. I don't know. Final thoughts, Ashley? I guess I have always known of Jennifer Grey as Ferris Bueller's older sister and the actress who got a nose job and then didn't do anything else. And I really wanted to read this book being like, oh, no, there's so much more to her. And I, I can't say there is. Yeah, she really is interesting adjacent. She's somebody who was born into a life full of intrigue and potential and promise and creativity where somebody could have flourished. She just wasn't inherently that interesting, and I think this book shows why. And I hate to say that, but she did not do a ton of digging. She did not do a ton of analysis. There was I literally don't know who this book was for besides herself and feel deeply in my heart that she only wrote it because her dad wrote a memoir. yeah. Anyway, I want her to figure out what she likes. I think the problem is that she only knew of two things. And I think that she never discovered what her passions are. And I want her to find them. Like, I, she's I guess I don't even care if she finds them. I like know it. I'm like, she's doing fine. If I could give passion to one person in the world, it wouldn't be Jennifer Grey. When did she make money? What, was, what money was she living on in her 30s? She says she did a Dr. Pepper commercial when she was like 23. And the money would just show up randomly all the time her whole life. I mean, she did a couple of things. She was in two seasons of a sitcom, but we don't know because she really talks about it. But I think there's always something here, something there. I feel like she lived off of men a lot, honestly. And she doesn't ever explicitly say it, but she says a ton that she never had any money. She never made that much money. Interesting. Jamie Lee Curtis is footing the bill. (laughs) Jamie Lee Curtis has money. Yogurt money. Those poopy yogurt. (laughs) Ew. Okay. (laughs) Ashley, what are we talking about on the Patreon this week? I don't know, man. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> well, be there, be square. We love you so much. 